Oh, I can look this up. Okay. Maybe it's about time to get started. Hello everyone. I think it's time for us to get started. Welcome to the COSI Working Group meeting. I'm Ivalo Petrov and uh, this is Mike Jones. Uh, we are the COSI chairs. Uh, I will start with a few reminders. Uh, this session is being recorded. This is our note well. I imagine everyone is familiar with it, but if you are not, please uh, read it before participating in any discussions. Uh, another reminder, please be nice to each other. And uh, if there are divergence of opinions, please focus on the technical aspects and not on the people. And here are a few tips about how to use the tools. Um, yes. Okay. And a few links that are general for the uh, this ITF meeting, in case you need them. And uh, the next item is the note taking. Christian has agreed to uh, be taking our notes and uh, please everyone else also try to help there. Uh, this is really appreciated. Okay. And then we will provide status of a few of our working group uh, documents. And Okay, let me try to talk a little bit closer. Sounds good. So uh, next is the status of uh, different working group documents. And the CWT claims is uh, scheduled to be in IESG telechat at the end of this month. Uh, the BLS key representation <laughs> is waiting on some related drafts in CR and CFRG. And uh, the post-quantum drafts are waiting for underlying algorithm drafts in and NIST. And uh, they are also looking some for more feedback. Uh, and the Merkle tree drafts are also waiting for some more feedback. Uh, and the TSA, TST header parameter uh, was recently adopted and uh, there is no more um, progress since then, so they will not be presented today. The rest of the working uh, group drafts will have presentations today. And uh, with that, this is our agenda for today. Is there any bashing of this agenda? I hear none, so we will move to the first presentation and uh, yes, Mike. Hello, I'm Mike Jones. I'm not being a chair right now. Um, my co-chair is going is chairing this session. I will talk with you today about uh, what's happened with the type header parameter draft. Next. So this is a refresher, but I won't spend much time refreshing. What does this do? It adds a type header parameter as a protected header, uh, which enables typing the entire COSE object using either a co-op content format number or a media type with media type parameters. This parallels what's already in the COSE draft for the content type value, which was included, but for reasons that I that are lost in history, for some reason, COSE didn't also include the type header parameter 
that was present in Jose. This aims to rectify that. So why do this? Um, the JAT BCP uh, recommends what's called explicit typing, where you put an identifier of the kind of thing that it is in the thing in a secured way. That way, uh, thing one and thing two can't be confused by recipients. And if an attacker tries to repurpose thing one into a thing two context, it can be rejected. That's what explicit typing does. There's a security reason for adding this feature to COSE, which parallels that in the JOT BCP. So what's happened since we last met our heroes in San Francisco? Um, we asked for feedback on the draft from the working group. We received that. Uh, we published a new draft that incorporated that feedback. That draft was adopted by the working group. And until a couple days ago, we'd received no more feedback on the draft, which I largely interpreted and my co-author Ori as uh, people seem to be largely good with this. Karsten gave us some useful feedback on uh, wording having to do with entity type uh, parameter, not entity type parameters, uh, content type parameters. That's a typo on my part. That, sorry. That's from a different draft in a different world. Um, so we added language saying yes, and sometimes there are uh, parameters on uh, entity types. And we published that. I wanted to get that feedback into the draft um, from Karsten before we got here. There's been no breaking changes to the draft um, and no other feedback have been received since working group adoption. Karsten. Carsten Wormann, I just wanted to say um, great PR you, you put in there. I still have some wording changes, but wording changes are a good thing to suggest at a working group last call. Yeah, so <laughs> please absolutely. charge full speed ahead. And it's also the case that this draft is now being recommended in another draft, which is, I think, the one you want the wording changes to, but we can work that out, um, which is the CWT claims in headers, which is recommending that, you know, gosh, if you have claims, you actually want to define the semantics of them. And uh, doing explicit typing is a great way to say, and this is the specification that defines the semantics of these claims. So there's uh, interlocking benefits of these two drafts. So, um, Having talked with uh, a number of people about this, I think we're at a point where it's time for working group last call. Um, but that's not my call because I can't share my own draft. Uh, Evo, do you want to think about that? Um, yes, I think we can. If there are no further comments, let's say until the end of the ITF, I think we can start the last call see what will be the feedback there. Right. And, and thanks again to Karsten for reading the draft and helping refine the wording. I'm done. Um, this is Kohei. Um, so I'm uh, giving a super quick update information about uh, the key sampling. Okay. Um, since um, ITF 117, so I got it uh, three updates for the key sampling. 
So I'm, I'm giving a walkthrough to av avatar update. And first one is a uh, supporting symmetric kit. And this is a uh, um, requested in IETF 117, um, especially um, suit uh, use cases. So what's so the adding and definition is uh, very simple. So and uh, supporting the uh, symmetric key values. And uh, so the, um, we added uh, also um, security consideration. So because so the key sum value is uh, leading to the expose the originate uh, symmetric key values. So we added uh, um, warnings about the uh, um, entropy size for um, protecting or uh, um, restricting or uh, guessing uh, um, original keys. Yeah, um, entropy size, yeah. And second update is uh, adding about uh, um, CWT confirmation methods uh, definitions in um, key sum print draft. So um, RSC um, 8747 defines the uh, um, key proof of possessions um, in the CWT um, claims. So current um, uh, draft, current RSC defines the uh, three types. Um, cause keys and the encrypted cause keys and the key IDs. So in this draft, adding the fourth um, types. So the value of a key sum print is a uh, can be used as a, a confirmation based values. So the um, block um, blocks um, circle uh, square is a uh, shows a uh, um, displays a uh, sample of uh, confirmation. Samples. So, but so this is a very similar about the uh, depops in the OS. So there are no a special difference uh, between the yeah JWK ones. And the uh, final update so is a uh, Kozeki sampling URI. So, and this is a uh, uh, proposed by Orie. So thank you for Orie. So this is a uh, um is a uh, also that similar uh with a. Uh, uh, JWK sum print URIs. So under uh, the purpose is uh, yeah, so the same ones. So the we define the new um, prefix um, that is a uh, um, show the green strings a uh, CKT. Um, but so the other the other uh, values are very similar um, with the uh, JWK sum print URIs. So hash always is a uh, choose from the IANA named the information uh, hash algorithm registry. So not a um, cause algorithm uh, registries. And the value is a uh, base six uh, for URL encoded, it's a cause key sampling, uh, b binary string values. Okay. So finally, so I show the comparison, comparison with the uh, noze functionalities. So the um, about so the key sampling function, so uh, we now cover uh, all of uh, um, the key functions uh, similar ones. So there are some uh, um, difference, but so we cover we now cover the all functions with uh, yeah, the ones. Okay, final. So the next step. So this um, ideas was uh, shepherded by Mike. Thank you, Mike. And so we think uh, ready for the uh, uh, sending the IESs. So there, if there are no comments or no objections, thank you. Any questions or comments? Justin Bowman again. Um, I was just intrigued by, by one of your slides. Can, can you go back a little bit? One more? Yeah, this one. Um, the, the IHF parameters URNs are uh, unmitigated disaster. We, we, I think we all agree on that. Um, but I think in this particular example, there may be a little bit of a confusion uh, potential here because um, it actually talks about OAuth, and people may be thinking that uh, this particular way to take a thumbprint is somehow limited to or, or specifically uh, designed for uh, OAuth. 
And I think that that's uh, not necessarily the, the best situation uh, because it uh, can uh, simply impl uh, influence implementer's choice on, on what mechanism to use. Uh, so I think getting a more neutral COSI uh, wording uh, in there would be useful. I mean, this, this is a curse of text-based representations that people start reading them and uh, finding things they don't understand and uh, that creates confusion. Okay, thank you for comments. So, um, so basically, function is a so that is a we need it. So, but so yeah, you comment is a very exactly so. Um, so yeah, I try to fix it uh, for avoiding the confusing. Okay. And next is Christian. Uh, Christian Amsus, um, we recently had a situation in in CBO where the question was like, do we go for uh, NI for the NI hash registry or do we go for a cozy uh, registered hashes? And the impression I got from that re um, discussion was that the like the the NI um, registry is not that well maintained. So can you talk a bit about like why why pick that and not take what is kind of what we already have around? Um, so yeah, you pointed about uh, blue parts, okay? Yeah. So, uh, so, um, so my, my thoughts is uh, so yeah, this URI uh, is uh, treated as a, um, so not a binary strings. So as a treated as a um, um, usually so for displaying uh, strings, so um, so choosing from um, IANA, a uh, cause IANA registries is uh, so finally so we embedding the value is a uh, um, as a um, number st number styles. So that is a uh, um, so from my from my impression, so that is uh, not good for um, so just. Uh, Reading by a human or that are use, uh, using a display style. So, yeah, um, if you if we want um, the some print URIs uh, treat it as a binary string. So yeah, I think uh, we think uh, we try to think uh, uh, changes the format or styles for the uh, binary string styles. Yeah. Is that good? No. I th I think it just makes implementations harder if they have to deal with two different registries. Uh huh. Okay. Okay. So, how about so the changing the Bruce uh, sections to using the just the uh, um cause ion uh, choosing from the cause ion algorithm registries is it a good improvement or um there is there any your ideas? Not sure. I'd take that offline. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, this is Mike not speaking as a chair, but I am speaking as the primary author of the JWK thumbprint URI um, and as shepherd for the document. Um, the Kose Key thumbprint uh, URI document made exactly the same choices as the JWK thumbprint URI document, which I think is appropriate. Uh, there is an OAuth registry for these kinds of parameters. It is fine to reuse it. Um, it's also the case that we got a lot of feedback on JWK thumbprint URI to use the existing IANA uh, SHA or uh, hash algorithms registry. So that's what we did and that's what they're doing. I uh, do not think any changes are needed to this document. But again, I'm an individual, not the chair saying that. Thank you. Yeah, Kirsten Norman again. Um, Mike's argument of course, is a good, of course is a good argument. I just think I have a slightly better argument. Um, and I wanted to, to answer to uh, Christian. Well, in this case, this would be minus 16 instead of SHA-256, because uh, minus 16 is the number that, that SHA-256 has in the COSI uh, registry. So we have everything in place 
uh, for that. And I mean, the thing already is, is ridiculously long, but um, yeah, we can at least save a few characters there. Okay. Um, so, okay, so yeah, um, we have uh, discussed about the uh, um, this um, some print your style in the uh, mailing list. So yeah, please share your opinions. So I tr we try to yeah implement to uh, making a consensus. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So good afternoon, everyone. I'm Joran Selander. I'm Joran Selander. Okay. And um, I'm going to talk about uh, the uh, latest updates to C509. And I have two questions for the working group somewhere in the middle and in the end. Um, there was two minutes slides. There we are. So C509 um, is, as you know, a compact representation of X509 certificates using CBOR. And having attended the SCIT working group in, on Monday, I realized that uh, it's not forbidden to use CDDL and CBOR diagnostic notation in slides. And that might actually be, if you do understand that, that might be an easier way of explaining what, what they are, just as a recap or a crash course. Uh, so you see on the right-hand side is CDDL. Uh, and at the top, there is a C509 certificate defined as an array with two instances to um, two elements there is a to be signed certificate and the signature and to be signed sign certificate is the, is the rest so if you know x509 certificates you recognize all the um, components here except the first element the type and the type uh, there we have defined two different types of c509 type zero indicates that everything is uh, that the signature is on the CBOR structure. And type 1 indicates that the signature is on the original X509 certificate. So that's basically C509. And there are more details in the draft, of course. Um, where am I going to point? Here. And here is the CBOR diagnostic notation of an example. This is taken from DRIP. So um, this is a regional airspace authority certificate in the example drip dki and this is as you see in the first element it's one it's a type one certificate and then there are the annotations of the contents the serial number issuer and so on and if you do x509 you get 331 bytes if you do c509 you get 183 bytes and that was sufficiently relevant for drip to think that this is an interesting technique to use so the changes since last version is, uh, yeah, I mentioned the uh, interaction with DRIP, and uh, they have common names, which are byte strings. So they wanted to have a compact representation, and we already had a compact representation of EUI64 as byte strings. So we needed to add a byte for dis disambiguating that. And then we did some work on the CSR, Certificate Signing Request, in, in an enrollment setting. Uh, so what we have is what is new or what is requested from Lake is that we are using certificates with static Diffie-Hellman keys. And uh, then we need to have an enrollment method for that. And there is RFC 6955 by uh, Jim Schrod and Hema Rafal Chandra, which is defining non-signature proof of possession methods. And the good thing with using CSR uh, with static Diffie-Hellman keys uh, is that you get a Mac instead of a signature, so it's a more compact object. And then the same goes for, for the actual use of the static Diffie-Hellman. So we included that. So there is now methods for non-signature proof of possession in the signature algorithms registry, which might be confusing, but that's aligned with what RFC 6955 is doing. And it also requires a public key 
public development key to be distributed out of band. But that's sort of how the protocol is using that need to take care of. Uh, we looked also at the attributes for CSR and uh, used the extension request structure, which is one attribute. And then uh, we also used that for adding other attributes like challenge password. Um, we had interactions with some other people, uh, some comments from Liu and Liao on specific assignments of extensions attributes that he found relevant to make. And this is extensible, you can do this later, but we did it already in, in this document. Brian Sippers finds some errors in the extended key usage table and some updated security, legacy considerations, examples, and so on. We also, uh, as agreed, take, took out all the rela revocation related content from this draft. So that's now separate content. And the question is, how should we handle that? Should we submit an individual draft with this? Or, I mean, this is essentially content coming from, from this draft, or do we need a separate adoption call? Any, any views on that? Yes, please, please do. <laughs> so the, the, the resolution, so, so, yes, the resolution uh, we generally have found is that if we want to split a document in a working group, we can just do that. And uh, we can also decide that the part that we have split out is, is a little, little bit of lower quality and has to be in an individual document again. Both decisions are possible and that's really for the working group chairs to decide. So if, if we actually think that revocation is already kind of accepted as a subject of, of the working group, then we should just split it as two working group documents. If uh, that's not the case, then we should split it out as one individual. <laughs> okay. okay, we don't need to decide now. The question is answered. Was, there was not a question or, yeah, Bob. I've enjoyed working with the, uh, your team um, and your reception to uh, on the things that I'm working on. Um, as I've mentioned before, I'll say it here. The one thing that this needs is code to actually convert a DIR to C509 or convert the C509 to the DIR so that we can actually show that here is a, a certificate and here is a CBOR encoding. We can put our documentation, the rest of it, and, and whatever else we're doing. So one of the important things that the team needs to do, or others chip in and help the team, is get some code so that we can actually be able to do this. And preferably, like, I can run it in Python kind of a thing so I can generate these sorts of things, and other people could do the same. And that's my, my one request here to, uh, to the work group that we have a very, very good, important structure to help us out, particularly on highly constrained networks, um, but we need the tools too. Thank you, Bob. Yeah, we have discussed that. We come to that in the next steps. Okay, but there is one remaining question from, from my side or from the author's side, uh, which we didn't manage. Oh, sorry, it's not a comment here. And John Grace. Hi, yeah, it's uh, John Gray. I'm just uh, wondering, so you showed that uh, byte comparison difference, the 180 versus 331. So that's a good savings. Have you done any comparisons with like post-quantum algorithms? Um, so I would expect that the savings wouldn't be so much. I, I mean, just, just what, what is being compressed is not the signature yeah, or the key. Right? Or the key. Yeah, so, I so it's imagine. the rest. Yeah, it's just. I mean, in this so, case, yeah. So usage of it probably for legacy stuff will be great, but I wonder in the, the post quantum world, it might not have as many advantages. But anyway, yeah. thank you for the work that you're doing there. Thank you. You get about the same number of bytes compressed out, which really won't have much of an impact on a uh, uh, post quantum computing certificate, which has some very large signatures on you. You save uh, you know, 130 bytes on one of those. It doesn't help all that much. So, but, but one point about the, the numbers here, this is for one certificate. So if you have a certificate chain, of course, like, like in the drip case where you might have three or four levels of certificates. So that's, that also adds up to the savings. But yes, this is for, for more for the 
constraint setting than the post content. So, but here was my, I think I'm running out of time. This was my final question. So what we have defined, I mentioned, but defined the CSRs. And um, so what we didn't come to a conclusion about is we have, as we have different formats of the certificate, the C519, we have the X519 and we have the two types of C519. We also have the uh, ability to encode the CSR in different ways. And that leads us to six options. But uh, what we propose is that we actually only uh, standardize two of those, which uh, did make sense to us. So we have the type zero here, uh, corresponding to the upper left cross, where we have the, uh, the CSR is, in, is encoded in CBOR, signed over CBOR, and you get back a, a native C509 uh, signed over CBOR, which is the, when, when you're using um, CBOR everywhere. Or, the other case would be the more the legacy case where you have the ASN1 there encoding uh, and you use C509 as a compression. Compression. So you start with the CSR signed over there, you, com you compress it to C509, you send it to the CA, and then you, before the CA, you unwrap it into, uh, into X509, uh, sorry, into in CSR encoded in there, you get back an X509. So those are the two proposals we have, unless people think there is any other options that are relevant here. Any? Karsten is walking to the mic. Here's the mic if you want it. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you for adjusting it for me. Um, can we just use the numbers one and three, uh, zero and three? <laughs> so uh, if, if our proof by lack of imagination failed, uh, then we can put in the other numbers. Nice, nice proposal. Thank you. Any other comments? Then I'm done. No, I'm not. Next steps. Okay, so we have a few remaining issues. That's this is not a lot, um, which we'll be fixing this year. Uh, we have a code. We have an an, an an Rust implementation, but it's not updated to the latest version, and that addresses. And it's actually only going in one way from X five hundred nine to C five hundred nine. Uh, so that is something which uh, we haven't had time to work on, unfortunately, and people are, are welcome to join here. We, we have plans for finding resources to do that. I have oh. a draft out that has code for making um, certificates, um, uh, uh, um I think it's ECC, PKI, something like that, I'll get it to you. But the point is that there are uh, 802.1 AR examples in there, okay. uh, specifically oh, in there, fun, yeah. and 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 we can look at that. We can work together, and I can get you some some good examples that you can then um, put into there. So we'll right. We'll I, I, I found one one example uh, <laughs> in in one of the RFCs, and the let's see now, was it the issuer was HTT Consulting when you coded it? So yeah, so that's currently <laughs> yours. Yeah, but Thanks, you'll, you'll see. I have a I have a draft that, uh, with actual code in it for making certificates yep. and 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 there are one ar examples in there thanks a lot so that was a third sub bullet there okay so but when we are yes. done with this we hope that this is ready for working group last call um but that's not right now okay i will just make a comment because i see it in the chat please introduce yourselves for the remote participants and the recording uh, when you make a comment this way it's more understandable who is doing it thank you and speaking with my chair hat on, I agree that you want to address the remaining issues. When you believe you've published a draft that's done so, send the list a heads up uh, and ask the question again, do you think it's time for working group last call? And then we'll evaluate that. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Okay. And... The next is HPK. Hello, I'm uh, Lawrence Lundblade. I'm here presenting slides that uh, Hannes and others 
put together um, because they are here with a conflict. And uh, Jitumi san is going to tag team with me on some of the presentation here. So, next. So, uh, since I were last here, we published the 06 draft, um, which had the uh, big change from uh, in, in how the algorithms were specified. We Instead of the uh, three separate identifiers, we moved to the combined uh, cipher suite, the, the more in the style of Jose, um, after quite a long uh, process on that. Um, uh, also, with that change, we, uh, there was uh, the way the encapsulated key parameter is, is uh, set up is, is, is different. Um, and uh, there's a Cypher Suite naming convention, and some Cypher Suites have been defined uh, in a rough draft, and there'll be a little more discussion on that later. Um, and I was added as an author, and uh, Jitumi San was added as an author. Brendan Moran was removed, and Ori was added. So big, I think we've had a lot of different authors on this draft. <laughs> so. <laughs> Uh, maybe we'll have different ones next next time. We'll see. Okay. <laughs> uh, and then there was a, a draft of seven published, which had an example uh, with Cose Mac. So the the HPKE is the co uh, is in the Cose recipient, which uh, is wrapping a key for uh, a Mac. That's that was the, the point of that example. Um, so here's an example. Here's a picture showing how uh, we went from the three integers ad uh, identifying the CHEM, the KDF, and the AEAD algorithms into a cipher suite. Um, so here's kind of a, uh, the summary of the, uh, the issues we're working on. Um, uh, so first, uh, cipher suite reduction. There's a I guess more cipher, su cipher suites to find than we think we need. Um, so uh, me san will talk about that in, a, uh, in the next slide or so. Um, with uh, COSE encryption, um, uh, there is this internal structure, uh, for, which is a, a context information structure, or, or the COSE recipient, which kind of is the uh, structure that is the data that is th that it's, uh, fed into the AEAD algorithm which is used to secure the externally supplied data and the protected headers and possibly some other stuff. There's a, um, a bunch of stuff in RC 9053 about that that references some NIST documents about KDF contexts. So we, th this has proved to be one of the more obscure areas in COSE. Um, it took us a long time to figure it out uh, for the stuff in RFC 9053, and now we need to do some work on it in uh, getting it clear for COSE HPKE. So that's definitely a, a, a work item. Uh, we also want to define um, a key representation. The plan really is not to define any new key representation. It should be pretty simple. Um, uh, you know, for HPKE, the, the, the keys are elliptic curve keys, so we believe we can reuse uh, has been defined in Kose keys already, um, but there's a little bit of work to do to, to, to link that up. Um, and then there was a couple of editorial issues uh, uh, in terms of readability and, and um, sorting in the documents. So those are the remaining issues. Um, all right, Ajit, do you want to take the on Cypher Suites? I'm going to sit down. <laughs> Oh. Hi, I'm Daisuke. Hi, I'm to me. Uh, I would like to talk about this uh, Cypher Suite selection. Uh, this is a major remaining issue, I think. And, uh, and uh, so uh, uh, since uh, we, we have uh, switched from the other quality approach to the Cypher suite approach. We have to this. We have to decide uh, which cypher suites to be defined in this document. And uh, 
And, uh, and uh, as you can see, uh, there are 16 uh, cipher suites are defined in the current draft for now. Uh, for now, and uh, but uh, I think I think the 16 cipher suites are maybe are maybe too too many <laughs> too many I think as uh, and uh, uh, so uh, we we have we we can we can reduce that and uh, so uh, and for and. Uh, for example, uh, the uh, how can I say? Uh, for example, uh, the the cipher suites are selected by the are selected by the <coughs> uh, the messaging layer security spec uh, is only only seven, but uh, but uh, and this is a uh, uh, there are sixteen cipher suites, so. And the uh, sixteen cipher suites, so uh, we we can we can read this and the uh, and the <laughs> so uh, the uh, what uh, uh, what I consider most uh, most problematic is that the uh, that the specifications for the the CP blah 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 and and K K E, uh, the chem, uh, C P blah 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 chem, uh, the on the table of this table, and the, uh, and the uh, you can see the X two five five one nine Kyber chem, uh, is uh, are not yet are uh, not yet published as a RFC. So, uh, these uh, these drafts can be updated, and uh, so. Uh, we <clears throat> can be updated, and the uh, and the specs are can be updated, and the are uh, the so uh, how can I say? <laughs> sorry, sorry, uh, and the can be. Oh, wait a minute, and the. So, uh, I'll wait a minute and the, uh, so uh, the CPR and the CP25 and the, uh, so, uh, wait a minute, <laughs> so, and can, uh, so, uh, the the CP. Uh, go ahead. Hi, uh, Rowan May. Um, so, one thing that was noted when MLS was selecting cipher suites is that the community that's interested in Cha Cha Poly is um, they're generally not interested in the in the NIST curve chems. And so, being able to we could remove <laughs> potentially okay. the uh. second, fourth, sixth, eighth, and tenth um, cipher suites on this list. And then um, I'm I'm guessing maybe where you were going with what you were trying to express with the CP chems is that you could choose to not register these right now and then allow someone else later to come and register uh, some additional combination of cipher suites <clears throat> once those become an RFC. Was that a direction you were thinking? Oh uh, yeah, I think it's not standardized. So uh, we, have to, we have to drop these cipher suites, I think. Mm -hmm. okay. Thanks. Rohan, um, could you do us a favor and put those recommendations in writing on the list. Sure. Thank you. Carsten Bormann. Um, 
I suggested a way to, to avoid all this, but uh, let's ignore that uh, at the moment. Um, we, we shouldn't forget this is the registry. Mm -hmm. So all the things we have in our registry toolkit apply. And uh, this in particular means that if something is missing here, it's not a disaster, we can just res register it. And I'm not entirely sure what the policy is right there, but I'm sure the designated experts will be very uh, welcoming to, to missing gaps um, uh, in here. And the other thing, of course, is that we also can do early allocation. So if, if the CP stuff starts to stabilize and the people actually want, want to use it, uh, we should really try to help them by, by giving them the, the code points. Um, so in the end, the, the decision which, which representation format to use for your uh, uh, various uh, cryptographic uh, items uh, shouldn't be one of uh, where can I get my registration the quickest. <laughs> that, that's uh, not, not particularly right. So we should uh, try to make it easy uh, to reg yeah. register these things. And I know that I'm, I'm in conflict here with other views and I'm certainly by myself in conflict with this view because I also share that, uh, that we should try not to register garbage. Um, so, so combinations that don't work, uh, th that have uh, uh, glaring security problems, uh, we, we shouldn't uh, register. I mean, we have registered SHA-1 and there was a reason for that and we have discussed it and so on. Um, anyway, so let's make it easy to get these things in and, and make it not a disaster to, to make a mistake on leaving out one of those. Karsten, I know that on list, Stephen Farrell had yeah. largely agreed with your let's not register garbage comment, probably using different words, but the same semantics. Uh, thank you. Uh, anyway, we are uh, so uh, the uh, CP blah 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 comes and the X R two five five two five five nineteen K uh, Kyber Kyber uh, is not standardized as our LFC. So we have uh, so the the documents documents can be updated and the, so are uh, the HPK equal the are the the references the reference information. Uh, to the to them are uh, are included in the Cosa HPK spec are uh, can be outdated so uh, so I think it is it is premature to include them are uh, in this uh, in this uh, Cosa HPK spec and so I think uh, there are four uh, there are four options. Uh, this X, A, A, B, C, and D. And uh, uh, the first A uh, is the same set of the cipher switch defined in MLS. And uh, uh, the number of the cipher switch is seven. And the B uh, is A plus the same uh, combination of the, the NIST curve based HP, uh, uh, DH cans uh, and ChaCha20. And uh, 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 the number of the server suite is uh, just 10, uh, only 10. And the uh, in the C uh, is uh, B or A plus some combinations using the uh, uh, compact NIST curve based DH cans. Uh, and the D, uh, uh, the last one, D is uh, uh, C plus some combinations using a post quantum uh, hybrid chems uh, uh, like uh, using a uh, Kyber. So uh, the current uh, current choice is D, but I think uh, uh, my I prefer A or B, A or B, and uh, my prefer uh, and uh, I think uh, B is a little bit better than B. Uh, because uh, B B has uh, some kind of uh, consistencies and uh, consistency of the sim sim uh, uh, symmetry uh, of the the combinations and the variations. But uh, but on the other hand, uh, A 
are a has uh, too few or uh, too few com uh, too few variations of using a cha cha twenty. So I think uh, I don't know, but uh, I think it's uh, uh, it's not good for cause use cases or uh, some kind of IoT use cases. So my preference is B. My and uh, I would like to uh, move forward uh, with B. Uh, uh, and I think uh, we, I think we uh, we can expand the set of the cipher suites uh, later uh, by uh, making uh, by making other documents after the related RFCs are published. So, but I would like to I would like to hear opinions uh, from the experts in this room. So. Uh, I'll yeah. note just as a procedural matter that if you include references normatively to things that are not yet RFCs, your RFC won't be published mm -hmm. until they become uh, RFCs. Mm -hmm. So if you want to finish this before the post-quantum RFCs are done, you can't mm -hmm. normatively use them. Uh, yeah. Uh, this, uh, these are the details of the four, uh, four ciphers, uh, four options, and so this is a, uh, this is a last drive on my part. So, please go ahead, Lawrence. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you. Uh, so, you know, this is just a sample of the key representation that we're looking at. Um, uh, I think the main thing to look at here that's different from typical uh, um, EC keys is that the algorithm here is one of the cipher suites that uh, we just were considering there. And note, note that that also has HPKE base in it to, to distinguish it from um, the other HPKE modes. So that's the, and you know, key. the uh, alg field in a cosy key is a is basically a, a key use restriction. So, um, so uh, we have a little ways to go here. This is just an early uh, option here. Let you know that we're working on this. If there's any comments on that? Okay. Uh, so uh, pretty simple. Uh, we've got some. Uh, the issues that we talked about, main, mainly the you know which cipher suites to define, uh, the, the context information structure, and the um, uh, the cozy recipient structure; those are related. Um, and then um, the definition of cozy key to, to align with this. So those those are the main open issues, the areas. And then um, also, I'd like to do some more with uh, test vectors and examples. All right, that's it. Any other any comments or questions? Okay. Am I next again? Uh, no. the, Are you presenting the guy? Again? I'm pretending to be Hannes again. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> then let's see again. Okay. I told Hannes that you know I didn't guarantee that the my presentation would be would be as good as his, so he and he agreed. So. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so. So this is a, a pretty early uh, proposal um, uh, for uh, basically a BCP for Jose and Jose implementation, implement, implementation designers and implementers. Am I going forward? Um, okay. okay. So. Uh, you know, we've got designer developers that are using Jose and Jose. Um, uh, you know, there's being more, becoming more common. Um, so the purpose of this this document is uh, guidance. Um, I think the uh, 
one of the most uh, initial ones was uh, key identifiers, how, key, how to use uh, key identifiers. I think that was what um, Hannes had in his document. Uh, then there was a couple other suggestions of, uh, for uh, by L, one by Elari about API design. Um, and then the, the last two are, are related. Um, again, that interesting contact in, context information structure and the ENC structure, which is you know, how you combine all the inputs to the KDF um, for, for uh, a lot of these. So um, I think we're, we're uh, pretty open to other topics that might be added. Um, so this is just really just getting started. So I'm not really looking to have a big discussion here other than maybe um, suggestions for other things to be covered. Uh, and I think this is the only slide here. Okay. So yeah, some discussion about key identification here, but let me just, so, yeah, so quite, I, I, I guess we can have a discussion about key identification. I'm not, I'm not the, since I'm not Hannes, um, I'm not really prepared, uh, ramped up on that. Um, but uh, any comments you wanna? So, you know, there's, you know, Jose, there's the kid, the key ID, unprotected header. So there, that's pretty open-ended what you can do with it. Um, there are also fields now, you know, Jose was first defined uh, 1952 and I guess 8152. Um, there was no X5U or X5C or X5T for including X509. Um, so, so there's maybe some clarification on it whether you should use KID or X5U and what if you got both. I think that was some of the things that Hannes had in mind uh, uh, to address in key identification. Um, there are also some folks that put the key identifier inside the payload. Particularly, I know, I know in attestation that's done, um, the device ID is the key ID, and the device ID is in the, the payload, so you gotta parse or decode the whole uh, payload to get the key ID. Um, I see some things. Lauren, can you uh, raise the mic, please? Okay, you can't hear me. Is that better? Okay, all right, thanks. So I'm just kind of going over the, uh, the uh, the items that Hannes had in mind here. Uh, so there we go. Um, oh, the also a suggestion for automated uh, use cases. All right, I guess I'm gonna ask, uh, yeah. I think that's all the content there is. Uh, any support, comments, agreement, disagreement? A couple of thumbs ups. Okay, good. Okay, I think that's it. Yeah, thank you. And yeah, if you have comments, you can also post them on the list. Tell Hannes I did a good job. Oh, hello everyone. Uh, hi, I'm Amaritra, and today I'll be presenting uh, the hybrid key exchange in Jose and Kose. And uh, so it's uh, it's a draft, which is pretty uh, it's uh, pretty early. Uh, it's in its initial stages. So and uh, so this is my first IETF meeting. So uh, let's go. And so yeah. Uh, well, uh, the problem statement or the motivation is basically. Uh, to basically, well, from the transition to post quantum cryptography. And so you use multiple, well, key exchange algorithms and you combine the results so that if one of the component algorithms are broken, uh, at least your resulting uh, chem is secure. And so this document it provides a construction for hybrid key exchange and it aligns with Jose and Kose as well. And we're presenting here the, well, the Kose version, it can be aligned to the Jose version. 
And yeah, so uh, the basic overview is, yeah, you have a hybrid shared secret. It's PQC plus traditional. Use the basic concatenate plus hash approach. Now, this specification uses a KM combiner, which is being also presented in the CFRG group uh, draft, as you can see. And it takes two or more shared secrets, and it returns a combined shared secret. Uh, we're going for in CCA2 robustness, so at least one of the KM must be uh, you know, in CCA2 secure. But it's essential to have at least one traditional or one PQC, otherwise the whole uh, algorithm, other than the whole goal, won't make sense. Uh, yeah, this is a generic definition of chem, where you have the key generation in caps, decaps. I'm pretty sure everyone here is aware of it. Uh, yeah. And uh, yeah, the terminology PQT hybrid. So there's another draft in the PQIP working group that's discussing, and the term hybrid in itself is a bit ambiguous in many aspects. So we are waiting for finalizing this term. And uh, we'll be using uh, KMAC 256 for each of the different uh, surface suit algorithms here. Yeah, uh, the KMAC function is actually defined in the NIST uh, SP 856C. And so it has like a context specific string and uh, basically the concatenation function and the length of output bits and uh, KDF function. That's just a string at the end. Uh, we have some specifications here. Yeah, I'm not going to go too much in details. It's the size length, which has to be there. And if it's a, a variable length key in this document, it can be padded to an all-bit string, uh, all zero-bit string to actually make it a 132-bit uh, byte output, sorry. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the chem combiner, this is one of the example that uh, we chose. It has to have a traditional part and uh, a PQC part. And uh, you have the old hash and concatenate, concatenate and hash, or whatever we want to call it. And uh, we have a R length where an encoded length is appended. This is also discussed in this draft as well. Uh, it's basically if you have uh, basically variable length or you don't have uh, another constant like in fixed from before. And that's actually essential. So it actually provides for variable length as well as fixed length approaches. Yeah. Uh, so thank you for presenting the HPK COSE draft just before this. Uh, we do acknowledge the presence of the HPK draft, but the hybrid term here and the HPK hybrid term is actually quite different. This draft focuses more on the traditional plus PQC exchange hybrids rather than the authenticated modes and the pre-shared key modes uh, in the HPK. And uh, it's preventing against an uh, CR cryptography relevant quantum computer as well as a traditional computer. And Kose already uses elliptic curve diffie ephemeral static. So we wanted to use that. And so this type of hybrid, what we're talking about, has already been discussed in other working groups as well. And since uh, HPK right now is not going to be focusing on the hybrid, the post-quantum hybrid game part, so uh, it might be useful to use the uh, ECDHES uh, for the post-quantum hybrid KM part. And yeah. So this is a very initial stage, and comments and suggestions are welcome. Thank you. Uh, so Russ Housley, I'm somewhat concerned that we're going to end up in a place where one library can't support the solutions that come out of both lamps, Cose and Jose, and that would be awful, right? Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So what we want to do is make sure that we end up in a place where one library does support all those. And the, the documents you cited on the bottom of the previous slide, um, I really hope that the authors are talking to each other because that's the only way it's going to happen. Yeah, there's a thumbs up from there, <laughs> right, <laughs> Mike? Uh, and so um, one of the things that happened in the LAMPS discussion is we talked about composite chems, and we a, defined a way to take two chems and combine them. And people uh, went, oh, that's really simple to implement, but oh my god, look at the computational explosion that's going to happen here. And so we ended up picking ones that made sense. Let's make sure we pick the same ones. 
Thank you. Absolutely. Yeah, we will be going for the cipher suit approach as well, but you know, just to focus on the right games would be quite essential. Yeah. Thanks. Hi, Jonathan Hamill, the Canadian Center for Cybersecurity. I noticed on your example slide there, you, you had, um, yeah, you, so you've chosen to use KMAC, KDF, and, and the ChemCom binary uses um, HKDF. Yeah. Is your intention, do you also do hybrid KDFs? Like no, this is actually the, I think in RFC 9053, if you see the, the Diffie-Hellman secret, that's actually not uniformly random. So we have to pass it through a HKDF. So... So hmm. why wouldn't you use the HKDF for for your construction as well, so that's aligned? Or, Sorry. Why wouldn't you use HKDF on the outer um, key derivation as well, so that you're not having to implement multiple? Oh, because like we were thinking from the Kyber perspective, it's already done before the shared secret is given, so it wouldn't make sense to redo it again outside for the basically the PQC part. That's not really done. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we can discuss on list. Yeah. Thanks. Mike Ellsworth, I'll also address Jonathan's comment there. Yeah, I think, so I'm the author of the draft that you got this construction from. I think the orange HKDF is not, that looks weird. So wh where did you get the orange HKDF from? Uh, well, I think, uh, I probably got it from the the original draft that was there from the Cosa 9053 draft. So the shared secret uh, was actually not uniformly random. So it was specifically for the Cosa purposes, it was mentioned to go to pass through the HKDF. What is the existing implementation which is already there? He's just combining that with the PPC part. Talk to talk to the mic. Yeah, sorry. Uh, yeah, so the orange part is the existing part which is already there, which is already doing the HKDF. The new part is the PQC part, which is uh, concatenated, and then uh, KMAC is applied to it. That was Tiru ready. Uh, right. Yeah. Okay. So we, the, we, I'm sort of commenting because at one point of the CFRG command commander draft, we did use a KDF at that layer, but then we replaced it with a length encoding. Okay. My second, I actually came up to respond to Russ about the algorithm. So I'm, I was asked to present at PQIP on Friday. And so I've got slides that take this draft, basically all the ones that are listed at the bottom of the other slide. Um, and I've got them all on a nice table and I'm showing the algorithm was actually, the surface actually do all align. If you look at all of those and put them in a table, the algorithm choices all do align actually quite beautifully. So hold your hat till Friday, Russ. <laughs> In the for what it's worth department, KMAC in and of itself is a valid KDF. I have extensive threads with NIST that of all the the, S, the SPUBs that they have to uh, update to make that official, but it is recognized that the, uh, the 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 sponge function does exactly what's needed. That what HKD what what FKDF does, and you don't have to mix them. You know, okay. you need KMAC. Use KMAC throughout. Perfect. Thank you. Or H, okay. no, one or the, or, or it's like, what is your underlying hash? If your underlying hash is shot two, then use H. If it's underlying is shot three, you know, four. Yeah, That's four. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Uh, Jonathan, I'm going to ask you to talk Any other in the queue? Thank you. All right. Um, presenting on composite claims. Next slide. So I have a problem, and my problem is that I have a CWT bearer token that has policy inside it. Um, and it has application-specific claims. It has generic claims that are defined elsewhere in RFC, so we can reference those. Um, but what I need is a way to put all of my different claims together flexibly. And so that's what I'm here about. 
Um, I think we need uh, a couple of new CWT claims. I'm hoping I can get interest and uh, uh, excitement built around this. Next slide. So the first thing I need is not logical claims. And there's absolutely nothing, nothing earth shattering here. Uh, the claim is and, uh, or, and nor. And there's a couple different ways to select those. Those are the ones I picked. We can argue with them. Um, but for example, I can do a very simple claim. Imagine I had a claim that was application specific that said, this bearer token is valid for this URI. Um, and, and you know it's valid for URIs that have the extension in 3U8 at the end of them. Fine. Um, but maybe we need it to be a little more flexible. We want to be uh, able to say things that end in M3U8 or .ts. That would be great. That would be flexible. Next slide. Sometimes bearer tokens go in unsafe places. Uh, people like to put these things in URIs um, where they will be logged and, and move all over the place. And sometimes we want to uh, hide the content of the claims. So uh, we already have a great way of encrypting things. And so uh, uh, I would like an envelope claim. So instead of saying the subject clause, uh, the subject claim is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, we say there's an envelope. And inside that envelope, there's a subject claim that has a value that is a cozy encrypt one object. And uh, if you know how to un uh, open that envelope, then you can find out what the subject claim is. Uh, without opening the envelope, you don't know the account ID. Next slide. And lastly, to make those other, other things useful and, work and, and functional, sometimes we need to know if the data inside is important. Um, Imagine if I have uh, uh, an envelope that has two private claims inside, right? Um, private one and private two, they're different claims. Uh, I, need to know, uh, I may need to know if the person who put those things in the envelope demands that I unwrap one of those envelopes if I'm willing to accept it. Because it could be that some uses of the bearer token do not require me to know the value of all of the claims. For example, if I'm accepting a bearer token that provides access to uh, private content, I might not even need to know the subject of that bearer token, right? Uh, I may only need to know the content and of course the issuer. Um, and so uh, the crit claim, which there is no crit claim defined for CWTs at this point, which I was flabbergasted to learn, uh, allows us to do this. Um, it's defined almost everywhere else in the ecosystem, but not actually as a claim. So we need one. Uh, next slide. So why am I here? Um, I, I have two options, right? I, I need these building blocks. Um, they are very basic, very generic building blocks. They are not specific to my application. They're not specific to my bearer token. Um, and so I, I could define them in the expert review section. It would be fine-ish. Um, or I could bring the work here because it's generic and we shouldn't each build our own building blocks. Carsten Bormann, um, being an expert reviewer for various registries, I sometimes think each registry should come with a dispatch working group. Um, so when something comes in, we can find out whether this should be a new working group or maybe a new research group should be founded to, to examine the general space and come up with good registrations. Um, so fortunately, we, we, we aren't at the expert review <laughs> the reviewer yet. Um, I think this is uh, uh, good stuff. Um, it can only stay good stuff if it is really uh, um, kept small. Because fundamental law is 
that once you do something like you're doing in your logical claims, you, re <coughs> you get in a programming language and it will be Turing equivalent. And there's, there's nothing you can do about that, but you, you can delay it as much as possible. Um, so, so getting some restraint on this and can, getting a design that really is Pareto optimal, so it solves the 80% and not the 20%. I think that, that's uh, really important. And I think that can be best done when you have a forum for discussion. Um, so my, my view would be that would be something we would be discussing in, in a place like the COSI working group because we are not going to generate a new working group just for this. Yes, uh, uh, there's no loop claim. <laughs> Hi, uh, Rowan May. So I heard you say, so it's not, the word bearer doesn't appear in the draft, but you said it in your presentation a couple it times. Did. It doesn't have to be. A, the, the, okay. These are basic building blocks. They can be used for things that are bearer tokens. They can be used for things that aren't bearer tokens. Yeah, it, it's 2023. I don't think we should be encouraging the use of bearer tokens anymore. Um, I also noticed that there wasn't any mention of any kind of binding. Uh, and I think that we really need to prevent people from, from using bear, like any new things that we define that allow for you know advanced generic functionality, they should require you to include some kind of a binding so that you can't copy and paste bear tokens from one place to another. Thanks. Hi, I'm uh, Tristan Miller. Um, I was wondering on the, so on the kind of encrypted chunks of it, mm -hmm. um, if you had considered uh, some of the parallel work in the selective disclosure work where, um, particularly where the Links of the claims aren't necessarily disclosed unless uh, you know explicitly done. Whereas if you just encrypt it, it feels like you are still disclosing a little bit of information. You have to pad. I'm sorry. Sure. Um, it, it just also seems like a duplication of work and kind of. So so there is a little bit of a difference. So. In the selected disclosure work, the bearer gets to choose what's, select, what's selectively disclosed, and the bearer is familiar is able to read all of the claims. The holder, holder. Yes. Um, the the holder um, uh, can read all of those and decides what to what to disclose. In this particular um, paradigm, and the paradigm that I that I need for the other work that I'm trying to do, mm -hmm. um, the issuer is the one who decides what gets disclosed. Okay, I got you. Cool. So, so I, I can't use quite the same primitives because there are different, uh, there are different properties that are, that are fundamentally desired by the different components. Um, you are correct though, in that uh, you're disclosing the length of the stuff if you do not, yeah, you are disclosing the length uh, effectively. And so, if the length contains information. So for example, if all of the, uh, the, the bearer tokens, I'm sorry, I'm gonna make people sad, that get issued are, uh, have uh, you know, nine digit account IDs in them, then you're fine. But if all of them have addresses in them, uh, and I can tell by how long your address is, where you live, or what country you're in, well then we may have a disclosure problem unless at the protocol level that implements this requires the appropriate padding in order to hide that information. Yeah, totally makes sense. Thank you. Um, per the conversation we had in the hackathon room, I think what you're doing is building blocks for a general authorization policy language. Yes. Um, so I wouldn't call those claims. They are, uh, it's a data structure. And, you know, we, we, there's a lot of people working in that space right now. I pointed you to a new working group yes. that is doing that. Um, 
and I, you know, it's work that's valuable. I don't think it's uh, policy operators are not claims. I'll just stop there. Okay. Um, I think there's, I might agree with you for the envelope. Um, I think that the, the logical operators, an and claim uh, is, is acceptable or not. And it's acceptable or not based on its contents, like, like all other claims, right? But that, that's super valuable feedback. Okay. And again, that was chair off speaking, not chair on. In the Open ID Foundation, there's a number of people who have come together who have a history of working on authorization systems. Uh, some of them, you know, the old XML based ones, some proprietary systems, and the working group um, for authorization in the Open ID Foundation that was just formed is called AuthZen, Z E N. Uh, you can search for it on the web and you will find it. Or particularly if you look in openid.net. All right. Um, yeah, so please look at executives and don't look at executives. <laughs> and some of the people in the Austin working group have exactmal scars. Yeah. All right. Um, oh, oh yeah. Hi. Yeah. So it's John Gray. Um, I don't claim to be an expert in COSE, but I, I had seen the composite. So I read it because just the name of the draft, because I worked on something that's totally different composite wise with PQ. But anyway, I noticed you mentioned about nesting and things can be nested to arbitrary lengths. And that got me worried that maybe some kind of parser or something could go into recursion or stack overflows or that. I don't know if that's possible, but I just thought maybe your language might need to be tightened up there if that's possible. You're, you're correct. Uh, okay. th there needs to be some language that gets added that basically says that um, protocols that use these claims need to, uh, need to tell you uh, what the nesting requirements, limits, whatever's appropriate okay. for that particular protocol are. Yeah, so um, it should, yeah, the implementation yeah. is going to have to define those. Okay, yeah, because you definitely don't want <laughs> unlimited. My number is 50, but your number may be different. Okay, yeah, just to sure, just, uh, yeah, okay, good. Just wanted to make clear. <laughs> Thanks. And if there are no more questions, I think we're done. The, the, the last slide was just, are there questions? Oh, okay. And I didn't need to ask for the questions. They came naturally. <laughs> so um, I believe that the uh, next steps are for me to revise the draft um, in accordance with all of the fantastic feedback I've gotten here and ask for adoption on the list. Yeah, that's, that sounds good. OK, thank you. And with that, we are at the end of our agenda items. So are there any other topics you would like to discuss? And Yeah, Renzo Navas. Sorry if this is a little bit uh, out of scope, but <clears throat> I was talking with somebody in the, in, on the weekend, and I'm quite interested in doing um, uh, post-quantum key establishment on IoT. So, for instance, uh, Kyber. And now, today we talk a, a lot about hybrid, Kyber will be there or not, we don't know. I, I knew that Ori, uh, he proposed some uh, cosy representation uh, of Kyber, he was discarded. I didn't discuss in deep why, but my proposal, not my proposal, just a question. Who will represent the game of Kyber? Will be, I know maybe it's not in COSI, maybe it's in Lake, I don't know. 
uh, it's something we want to work on how to represent a chem, post quantum chem, representing it uh, with Cibor. I, I... I'd suggest starting by having the conversation with Ori. Ori's only not here because he had a conflict with another session that he had to be in. Okay, thank you. Okay, anything else? Oh, I don't see anyone rushing for the mic. So thank you everyone for participating and see you again soon. Yes, sir.